So um, who can summarize what we talked about yesterday? Anyone want to take a stab? Anyone? What's one thing that you noted down, right? Or one thing you took out of class yesterday? So we talked um, talk about culture. Um, we came from its singular, right? Uh, basis. Yes. And, um, went to its uh, plural. Basis, and mm -hmm. finally, we understood that culture is not something singular, but plural. Okay. So this is the general. <laughs> right. So, super quick takeaway, right? We talked about the concept of culture, mm. right? The question, right, that I put in the syllabus, the question for yesterday's class was, how should we talk about culture, right? And um, we read this very dense text, right, and worked through the argument. Right? One thing we talked about was this difference between culture right, versus economy. Right? Culture is a sphere. Yes. Right? And cultures, right? this idea of American culture, Ukrainian culture, right? um, these ideas of, of things that might be bounded. Right? So we sort of talked about culture versus um, cultures. Right? So we did this very deep analysis of culture as a concept right? so that we could use it effectively, so that we can deploy this very complex, weird word, culture, in our work, right? And we talked about culture as something constructed, something that is a system, and something that has practices, right? And this relationship between system and practices, right? That we sort of see practices creating systems and systems creating practices um, when we talk about um, culture. So today we're talking about that question. How do we talk about culture in borderlands? So we're taking those very complex, abstract ideas of culture as constructed, systems, practices, and we're putting that in place, in the place of borders and the place of borderlands, right? So what you're kind of going to try to do is take everything we talked about last time and put it in a geographical location, right, um, in place. So all of you study borderlands, right? You all have projects on borders and borderlands. So what are some of the geographic places that you guys study? Nagorno-Karabakh. We've got a big group of that, right? Uh -huh. Can I put that down? <coughs> what else? Yeah. Um, for example, we don't talk about border, but about border and border. We we can include not only geographical places, but also, for example, practices of bordering. Yes. I explain, take what we're saying. Explain that more. For example, if you look at the border, not at uh, the object or at the place, but at the um, process of the bordering. Yeah. Like a practice, like yeah. a cultural practice yes. of the bordering or social practice of the bordering. That we can uh, investigate this notion or this practice. Uh, not the place position or point or line, but actually like a action of the creating border or yeah. constructing border. Yeah. I, I, I think to, to this point yeah. also like Van Buten talks about like borderization and okay. as an imaginary, as a process okay. that's that's internal and you carry the border with you per se, right? Yes. Yeah. We are all borderlands, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to go back to, to Alina what you said. I think that's really great, right? This idea that um, I've just said border is a place, so it's like a noun, mm -hmm. and you're talking about bordering as a verb. Yeah. That's fabulous, right? So that actually, um, this we can, for example, um, have a closer look at the art that we talked about. Art as a bordering activity. For yes. example, these propaganda films or something, uh, or the art, uh, that is laughing at the border, that distracts border. For example, uh, all these things we can consider as bordering practices. Yes, yeah, absolutely, right? So um, if we talk about these issues of culture in place, in the place of a borderland, one thing we might find, and I think we'll talk about this a little bit more in this class today, is this practice, as Alina is saying, of 
bordering, that many of your actions actually border. And I think you're precisely right that a lot of um, artistic production, cultural production, in a borderland is about bordering. I mean, it is about saying, this is mine, not you. Yeah. About naming, destructing, shaping. So uh, we can study art or culture as the practice of bordering, but not uh, exactly creating borders, but maybe some other activities. Destructing borders. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So on um, remember that, and we're going to come back to that, I think, on Thursday, when we talk about, um, you know, does art, exactly what you're saying, does it build um, bridges between cultures, or does it build walls? And I think that's a really um, important question. And a lot of the scholarship on art in borderlands um, makes a lot of assumptions one way or the other. And I think you're right to say, well, what if we looked at the, practi the actual practices, right? Um, so um, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, one borderland region. What are the other geographical regions you guys are studying? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry? Mexican border. Yes. Bradley. Um, I guess I would say that Nagorno-Karabakh is, in, for me in my research, it's a geographic focus, but it's, for me, an attempt to look at how different um, cultures of an idea, say European security, are bounded within the international context. Okay. So this idea of geography, but also how it reflects on two imagined ideas and things of that nature. Okay, awesome, great. Yes, awesome. Um, maybe the land between Poland and Ukraine, is it? Yeah, question. European Union? EU. Totally. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Ukraine and Russian border? Yeah. Maybe some borders inside um, the Ukrainian rural and uh, urban spaces. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can I just put rural and urban because that's kind of true? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The borders in the Balkans. Balkans, totally. Anywhere else you guys work on? Kaliningrad, sure. Do we take islands also or not? Huh? Islands also or not? Mm. Sure. Very interesting. Or rest in Taiwan. Yeah, islands. Just islands in general, right? There's so many examples yes. we can think of, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. In case of Brexit. No. Good Lord. <laughs> right, Northern Ireland. Right, I mean, yeah. yes, Borderlands and Brexit, right? A year-long course, right? Um, so uh, we have a lot of uh, geographic places that you guys are sort of working on in your work, right? Sort of all over the world, right? So you're taking these ideas um, of culture as sort of systems and practices and, um, and constructed um, ideas and um, studying them in a specific geographic um, locations. And as Bradley was saying, right, that leads you to certain topics, right? Um, whether it's about ideas and security, right? Um, but sort of how culture plays out in borderlands, in your borderlands that you're studying, right, shapes your research. So um, let's have a couple more um, examples, right, about how um, borderland or how systems and practices, how culture plays out in your borderland that you study. So Bradley, why don't you tell us a little bit more about systems and practices in Nagorno-Karabakh? Um, within with the idea I was talking about? Yeah. Uh, I would suppose that um, I look at it separately. Well, I think it's imagined differently within, per se, um, Russian decision-making Mulewe and a Finnish decision-making Mulewe. And then that's just one context. And that changes over time and in relation to other events that aren't necessarily in that geographic area. So there's a lot of influence, influential factors in different founded cultures, I suppose, that interact with this one geographic region or conception of what this region means. Okay, so you're talking about um, two different bounded systems interacting in a borderland. 
Right, and then other bounded systems influencing. Okay. So ideas of say security, but then you also have ideas of what it means to be European, maybe, and um, different values like what, um, what values should be incorporated into that. Yeah. So. Right. So this concept of, of something like security, right, means one thing in one bounded system, and something completely differently in another bounded system. Right? And if those two systems then have to make a policy or deal with a place, you're going to get a very interesting story. Yeah, and they have, this is like the idea of strategic culture. Yeah. Large discussion on that. Yeah, exactly. Right? Um, fabulous. Anyone else want to talk about their location and systems or practices in their location? Yes. Okay. For example, um, it's not my subject, my field, but um, there is a French uh, film about uh, creation of the EU and the demolition of the borders, of national borders. Huh. It's uh, called Nothing to Declare. It's a comedy about a small mm -hmm. French city uh, that was ac actually located on the border. Yeah. And all the activities was built around this uh, uh, transition point Cost between, I think, with Belgium, yes. I think with Belgium, yes. Yeah. And then with the arrival of the EU and the, the actually the deconstruction of the national borders, yeah. they are all concerned about this as a personal tragedy because there will be no business, there will be nothing yeah. to do in the city. Yeah. And this a uh, little bit sarcastic view at the uh, European Union and Union and the subjective uh, perception of this uh, fact or event. Uh, can be serve as a good example of the rethinking of uh, the concept of European European Union borders and yeah. bordering or rebordering or debordering. I don't know how to call it. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe right. Debordering. Debordering, right? An attempt to deborder, right? And 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 to what extent that is successful or not, right? Um, Anyone else? Examples? Yes. Yeah. I think if we talk about Ukraine, uh, the most actual for the moment could be their physical border that have emerged between uh, Ukrainian territories and Donbas area yeah. or Crimea. So the the physical borders that have created also the uh, their uh, symbolical boundaries and also life between the borders and also the practice of everyday life. Yeah. Yeah. yeah in these areas and also maybe crossing the areas. Uh, jump into another um, cultural spaces and yeah. uh, basically living on the frontiers of this uh, new emerge yeah. uh, boundaries. Yeah, I mean, this is a very interesting topic, right? The emergence of a new real border, right? There really is a border, right? And kind of all the ancillary borders and borderings we might find there, right? Um, uh, Alina brings up this very interesting question of process, right? We can see this process of crossing the border, right? It's dangerous, you know. Um, there's also, there's a um, scholar, Sophie Lambroschini, um, who's really wonderful. She's at the Center Mark Block in Berlin, and she's working on Vodadon Basu and how people get water. And it's really weird because you have a border, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, the water plant is in the Danev, but the offices are in Ukraine, and yet they somehow have to work together to distribute water, right? And so she's using that as this story of the border, right, of these practices of the border and how these sort of um, bounded systems are at once emerging, right, and yet still able to provide people with water, right? Very interesting story. Uh, hang on a second. Yes. Georgia uh, yeah. has uh, up today uh, the conflict with uh, his uh, uh, secession, uh, secession uh, yeah. state. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, it is. Um, I, I want to say something about uh, South Ossetia. Yes. Uh, it was this uh, big tensions was um, uh, since uh, 1990s, uh, uh, but uh, in the uh, until 2004 um, uh, they have uh, the. Um, 
uh, relations were uh, became warmer. So uh, there uh, at the borderland, uh, so uh, not not officially uh, from uh, our side, uh, it, it was not official uh, borderlands, but yeah. uh, Georgians, uh, Georgian citizens could not uh, uh, pass uh, this border. And uh, at the borderland, uh, established uh, a mar market, a Gneti market, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they had uh, intensive uh, relations, and uh, uh, it became uh, uh, very warm relations and very intensive. Yeah. But uh, then uh, 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 happened something, and these relations were colder. Yeah. Uh, it was a very good example that uh, uh, it belonged uh, officially not uh, Georgia, uh, but uh, uh, these relations, inter-ethnic uh, relations, yeah. uh, became warmer uh, until 2004. Um, yeah. I think. Yes. So it's interesting, like the space of that market. Mark right, shows this sort of shift in relations, yes. right? Fascinating. James, what were you going to say? Well, yeah, I, was, I was thinking about how borderlands are, are a cultural process, but where they intersect with resource management often mm. is, is, is constructed as a palimpsest atop natural processes. And these are natural sure, processes sure. that belie an environmental ethic or belie a response to climate change. Sure. I mean, I'm thinking about how many glaciers form borderlands in China and also in Pakistan and India, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. which is an area beyond perhaps our yeah. common, common commonality here, but uh, but how these watersheds and, and the rights to territory and riparian rights are, are reflected in, in ultimately cultural practices. So yeah. thinking, of, thinking about the natural and the fluid as well as ordered practices and bordered practices is important. Yeah, right, I mean, there's this whole issue of the environment, right? Um, and, and the environment itself creates borders, right? Um, or transcends borders, right, for sure. It'd be very interesting to tell the story of a border, um, actually not through people, but through the environment, right? Mm -hmm. be a really interesting um, project. So um, I think what we all sort of can, can think about, right, in these examples right, that you guys are giving, if you look at these um, geographic um, places, right, that are borderlands, um, the challenge is that there are many different groups in these places. Right, it's a basic statement, but I think it's important to really realize about borderlands that when we talk about borders, we talk about at least two groups, because you got one side of the border and the other side of the border. Right, um, people fighting over border. Generally, more than two groups. Right, but at least two groups. So you've got others. Right, you've got multiplicity. You've got difference. Right, and there's something that Stephen said yesterday that difference is, is scary. Right, that as soon as we have this sort of multiplicity and these multiple groups and different groups, the stakes rise. Right? Um, and so what's complicated, I think, about talking about culture and borderlands, um, actually to go back to this example, this market, that's a nice example, is um, to what extent is there cultures in borderlands i.e. Georgian and Alsatian culture vying for the market, right? So, and to what extent is there just a borderland culture, right? A market, a river, right? A place of diversity. Um, so what I want to sort of propose to you, actually, is that both of those things are true. And when we talk about um, borderland cultures, we're talking about both of these things at the same time. We're talking about um, groups that are trying to have their own culture, their own bounded system of beliefs, right? And we're also talking about a place that inherently has different cultures. And that in itself, that diversity, that multiplicity, might actually create certain practices and structures. Does that make sense? Right? That. Um, you know, are we talking about a borderland culture or cultures in borderlands? And, and both might be true. Okay, so we're going to sort of explore that a little bit um, more today. Um, and one of the ways that, uh, because there are different groups involved in, in borderlands, one of the concepts that if you read a lot of scholarship on borderlands, one of the concepts you find deployed a lot, used a lot, is transnationalism, right? Because trans going across, right, that implies immediately you got two things, right, because you're going from one to the other. So transnationalism becomes a concept that's used a lot um, in studies of um, borderlands. Can you think at all how transnationalism is a radical concept? 
How might transnational be radical in history? Bradley. Uh, just one example. It, it interacts with the disciplinary trend, for example, in history, of yes. history being um, a way of legitimizing the state. So it yeah. takes it out of the nation state context. Yeah, exactly, right? So, um, did you guys, so this is, a, um, I assigned very history articles today. Um, apologies to any uh, non historians, but you know, I'm a historian, so that's what happened. Um, but um, uh, does anyone know anything about the um, development of history as a, as a discipline, as a professional, professional discipline? Exactly. History is like a servant of a nation, right? I mean, it tells about, I mean, it's so poetic. So poetic. I love it. Yeah. History is a servant of a nation. Like still nowadays. So uh, it's interesting that as one of our colleagues, she said she's from Independent Institute of History, right? Of the of the research of urban history. So I found oh. it. I mean, I think it's very interesting because usually history used to serve like the nation, right? So it's like how to, as as she gave this interesting question, how to get out of that and become an independent historian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I have a very good example that illustrates this. In Ukraine, uh, the textbooks of history yes. are reg regularly reissued. Yeah. The regime changes. The history changes, mm -hmm. so we, maybe we can't talk about subjective, objective history, but subjective <coughs> history that serves to the nation. Exactly, mm -hmm. right? So history began as a professional discipline in the 19th century, precisely with the rise of nationalism, right? We sort of generally say this guy, Leopold von Ranke, mm -hmm. right, um, created this idea of, you know, Geschichte Wissenschaft, right, history as a science, and he did it to serve the creation of Germany, right? So he was writing history using archival sources, right? Using primary documents, primary sources, um, uh, which sort of suggests it's very objective work, right? But really the goal was, and he really believed this, right? Was that he was talking about the creation of a German, of a German culture, right? A bounded um, German state, right? So history develops with the nation. Right? And very much sort of is part and parcel of the nation and creating a story right, that reinforces um, the national. It's a narrative. Huh? It's a narrative. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right? In, in Ukraine, who's the, who's the father of Ukrainian history? Khrushchev. Exactly. Right? Khrushchevsky. Right? There is no Ukrainian polity when he's writing. He writes it. Right? He creates it in writing. Creating that narrative, right, is part and parcel of creating the Ukrainian nation, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I think to echo Bradley's point, um, transnationalism helps dissolve some of the, the structures that keep history rooted in that soil, right? Yeah. But also, it employs dangerous <coughs> binaries because you're talking about global and local, you're mm -hmm. talking about north and south. And yeah. the insider outsider yeah. dynamic that yeah. comes with the cultural study and application yes. of this yes. is is itself dangerous. I yeah. mean, like the South is a one dimensional thing, yeah. is right. an imperial construct. So it kind of replicates power or, or, or could break that apart. So it's, yeah. a, it's, it, it's dangerous in this concept. Yeah, so hang on to that. We're gonna, actually going to come back to that. That's awesome, right? So, um, so talking about transnationalism and transnational history um, uh, can be inherently radical because it makes the nation contingent, right? It, it, it doesn't assume the nation, right? It actually says we have to explain the emergence of the nation, right? And that can be a really radical act, right? We can certainly think about that in, in Ukraine. You're absolutely right about the textbooks, right? There's one story of Ukrainian history to talk about Ukraine in a transnational context can, in some circles, be really radical, right? Same is true for American history, right? Teaching American history in a transnational context, often my colleagues get questioned by our students, right? What are you talking about, right? America's the best nation, it always has been. And you're like, well, actually, not really. Um, so transnationalism can be inherently radical, right? So let's look at this AHR, American Historical Review, um, round table on um, transnationalism. Um, and so what I want you to do is actually um, break into some groups. We're going to do a little physical movement. We've been sitting for a long time. Um, so break into groups of three or four. 
could just sort of move your chairs closer to each other to some people you want to talk to. Make some friends. Oh, yeah, I know, she's turning that way, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so break into some small groups. They can be four, they can be five. No judgment. Sort of a big group. That's fine. Let's go for it. Big group. That's great. Oh, we've got. Oh, that's sort of a. Fabulous. Um, so what I want you to do, um, you know, uh, it's a funny piece, this AHR roundtable, um, because it's a, it's a conversation, right? So it's not like each of them sort of lays out an argument, right? It's not the same kind of article we read yesterday. Yesterday was this really clear-ish article with an argument, right? This is more kind of some pretty smart people making some ideas, right? Um, so what I want you to do in your groups is pick one person, one of these contributors that you liked, that you agreed with. You read what they thought about transnationalism and it resonated with you, right? Might have made it seem useful, right? Something you agreed with. So I want you to pick one uh, person, one contributor to this roundtable that you agreed with as a group and pick out one quote that you, that you thought was really useful, right? That you might be able to use in your work, right? That sort of summarize something useful for you about transnationalism, okay? Who would like to start? Yes. Um, actually, I have been chosen the, uh, the ideas of Matthew Conway. Okay. Uh, most of all, I like it because uh, he tried to ex explain that it would be difficult to exclude cultural studies from any field of history. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he brought an example how nations come about. Uh, this is um, generally being explained by by art of culture. Yeah. And he also adapts that culture helps to shape what is normal or, or not in world politics. Yeah. And it also argues that cultural studies explain how stat statistics and figures are in strategic political projects. So in general, um, Matthew Conway underlines the importance of culture in yeah. any field yeah. and any aspect of politics. Yeah. So what is my disagreement um, with his argument? Yes. Uh, it's that uh, is that there are a lot of other components mm -hmm. uh, which help us to understand any political uh, direction, situation, project, the results of any project. Uh, so all kinds of processes. One of them can be the political interests. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, political interests are higher than the culture mm -hmm. or even the identity. So. Uh, we should take political interests also, and uh, to, and never forget that uh, political culture alone cannot explain any political process. Yeah, political culture alone cannot explain any political process. Mm -hmm. That's great, right? So um, that's fabulous, right? You really liked this quote, right? But then they're like, well, actually, yes. sometimes politics is important, yes. right? Yeah, absolutely. That's really great. Anyone else? Queries, questions, comments. What's missing? I think there was an argument that it's very hard to teach transnational history. Yeah. And I uh, question then how can what for the transnational history is if we can't transfer no knowledge? Yeah. So what yeah. can we do with this? Yeah, there was an argument somewhere, but I can't find there. there. Yeah, there are very little scholars that work in the translational history, and it's very, very difficult to teach translational history. Yeah, so it was a little bit more. Yeah, so you're saying that? So, yeah, in the roundtable they do they talk about how well it's hard to teach this. Um, so often jobs are tracked around nations, mm -hmm. 
right? Um, and and you're saying, okay, but like the point is to transfer. Like the, the point is you have to teach it. So we need to transfer transfer knowledge. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So so if you were to take the these scholars out to lunch, mm -hmm. you might say, okay, guys, really. What will we do next? Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Fabulous. Anyone else? Well, we can also say that uh, this transnational history may be also a kind of uh, intellectual fashion which comes and then goes. Yeah. And so there is a comparison between uh, transnational history and postcolonialism in the article. So we yeah. uh, there was a period uh, in the beginning of the 1990s when postcolonial studies became very popular. Yes. And uh, there were many monographs and yeah. produced in this in this key and uh, so. Uh, we can say that, like, uh, if uh, the scientific uh, scientific uh, uh, fashion yes. uh, sh should, sh should should have some time to demonstrate its potential, because yes. otherwise it is, it, is, it is difficult to say whether it's productive or not. Yeah, absolutely, right. Um, you know, that's what I think one of the challenges um, of being a scholar, right, and doing a PhD, right, is you want to be on trend enough to get that published and get a job, right? But you don't want to be too trendy that, um, that it goes out of fashion, right? That your argument gets dismissed later because it was just part of a trend, right? Um, absolutely, and that's absolutely one of the challenges of this round table, I think, is really making us think about, okay, is this just you know, a hip trend or is this a really useful method that we can use right, in our work? Yeah, Alina. They try to um, build their position between the national history and transnational history. Yeah. But I think that they are not possible one without another. But yeah. if we look closely at the text, they try to oppose the translational history as a history of flows, movements, migrations, diaspora, to the national history as something that exists apart, isolated. Yeah. So maybe it's not, not very... Um, interesting from the perspective of the research because we need to take into consideration the factors of the national history while we are studying the transnational issues. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good point, right? Maybe these two, um, that maybe to do really good transnational history you have to really study the individual groups, right? Not just the flows between, yeah, for sure, yeah. There's a, there's a line that I, is it maybe Chris Bailey who says it? I can't recall. Um, but uh, they said maybe we've succeeded. They say maybe we've succeeded when when we're when we introduce the term transnational history, we're met with the same incredu incredulity as somebody who asks if gender or environment have a history. Which I, right. I think you know that that's a good way to look forward. But those fields are not settled. Also, right. And right. Um, you know, I, I think uh, there is a, an excellent book I, I had the opportunity to review called Eurasian Environments, and uh, one of the sections of that book dealing with the environmental history of, of the Soviet and czarist space mm -hmm. was uh, bodies and disease, health and environment. And, and one of the articles in there is called Strengthening the Tsarist Empire's Immune System, Environmental Cures Along Crimea's Coast of Health, which is fascinating because it, it doesn't talk about transnationalism, but it's about the appropriation of things like kumis sure. and sanitarium, sanitarium sure. culture and such as part of, of embodiment. And I think the issue of scale then becomes really important in telling this history because transnational still focuses on this this higher order, yeah. whereas the body, while you know the subjecthood of the body might prohibit it from leaving national space, the body is still the immune system is still a thing. It's still inherently connected to global processes, demog demographics, epidemiology. Transnationalism might be about moving over those borders, but should also be about non-human processes in mm -hmm. this regard as well. So we need to also consider something they haven't really talked about, object geography, material culture, yeah. again, and how those things move and are moved. Yeah, and I think that question of scale is really important, right? I mean, I think, can you write a great transnational history about a market? I think you can. Can you write a great transnational history about a micro study of one his, you know, city, of course you can, right? So it's about thinking about scale, right? Um, and of course, these historians are all sort of big, big scale, uh, you know, um, thinkers and writers. So um, I think that this uh, round table gives us a lot to think about about transnational history, right? As a, as a method, as a way of thinking, a way of working. Um, but you guys are absolutely right to pull out some of these sort of questions and queries um, that this article 
raises. And the three other readings that I assigned for today kind of speak to some of those um, issues and questions, right? Um, so we're going to move a little bit to um, having our um, three amazing volunteers um, talk about uh, the other readings. Um, uh, Alina, you did the Philippe Thayer article, yes? Okay. Um, so we're going to start with the Philippe Thayer, um, or Thayer, I don't know how he says his name, um, um, in the journal uh, Critica, um, of kind of reflecting on this roundtable and saying like, hey guys, there's a whole other region that's like a sixth of the world that y'all didn't talk about, right? Um, and um, one of his arguments actually is that um, inherently the doing of um, history in that Eurasian region is inherently transnational. And there's some issues with his article as well, but um, he really challenges these scholars and this round table that they omitted a very important part of the world, right? Um, so let's turn to the Philippe Thayer article and um, Alina's wonderful summary so that we can all do it. You can totally stay there if you want, or you can come up with whatever you want. Um, well, so the, the article is truly interesting and wonderful, and um, it contains a lot of uh, examples, uh, historical perspectives, which I unfortunately I will have to skip uh, <laughs> and uh, suggest you uh, to read and enjoy uh, the entire article. So I just mm -hmm. I just go to their uh, the main points and. Uh, so, um, Philip Ter is the proponent of transnational history and <coughs> he focuses on Ukraine as an example of how uh, transnational history can be conducted uh, in, in this area. And also, his other question is how Ukrainian history is part of the broader um, trend of our thinking about European history. Mm -hmm. So how to include Ukraine into European history and how uh, to study uh, something very local and still uh, be part of the broader uh, transnational trend. Uh, so in order to understand what uh, tr uh, transnational history is about, uh, she star he starts with uh, understanding what is national history and he says well, that um, uh, the, its main focus is continuity in terms of time and space on the ethnicity. So uh, it is not necessarily nationalistic, uh, but the problem with national history is that it, it excludes a lot of people uh, and it focuses on ethnicity. So it becomes purely uh, ethnocentric. So this is the, the, the major, um, uh, well, not the minus, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. the. the um, the limit of the national history. Also, another limit is that it becomes um, very much involved in the politics and the local elites start to um, support certain vision of the past, therefore making this past also very much um, selective um, and uh, not inclusive. Uh, Therefore, uh, he proposes how to uh, go beyond these uh, limitations and, uh, and comes basically to their ways how transnational history can be studied. Uh, so there are several options. He proposes to focus on basically the exchange mm -hmm. uh, which is possible between their uh, different boundaries, between different cultures, and, uh, uh, multiple cultures. Um, and he also says that it could be the analysis of their um, input that some area or idea or people or group uh, is influencing others and, and the same um, from the other side. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so first of all, it is the perspective of comparative history that, that can, can be implied and this means that um, different countries can be analyzed in the context of certain issue. Um, and there, uh, the, 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 any, uh, the example that he provides is that there, are, there exist a lot of uh, multi-ethnic cities, not only in uh, our emergent Europe, European space, but also in Ukraine. And so we can, uh, we can take one issue and study their multi-ethnicity in Kyiv, Lviv and Odessa. Uh, plus, uh, we can do the same as broadening this perspective to uh, adding cities like Riga, Vilnius, Prague, because they have the same uh, the same issue of being multi-ethnic. So this is first comparative history. Uh, another focus is the tra transfer history. It focuses on foreign influence of particular cultures um, and adaptation of imported cultural goods. 
so it is basically about uh, their uh, cultural uh, imports, exports, uh, uh, and plurality of idea that uh, that comes. Um, also, what he, what is interesting here is there uh, several um, uh, notions that he uh, that, that he mention uh, uh, critically that uh, even if it is translational history it, it can be still uh, politically motivated and uh, we can choose uh, certain uh, certain countries because uh, we want to have certain results or we can put us into some emergent uh, space uh, together with others with whom we would like uh, um, uh, to be associated with. So this, the, the, there is certain political choice uh, behind this. So uh, one should be careful about this. Uh, another thing is that uh, if we if we study there some sort of influence and uh, and input that some cultures uh, take or bring from others, uh, it is not it is not only their adaptation and the positive element of it, but also their um, <laughs> um, but it, was, it, it can be also about resistance um, and uh, adaptation, something new in order to uh, protest of, uh, of their well, sorry, very complicated to, to explain the, the for it clear but a very good idea. So I will probably go to example, you will understand. For example, <laughs> they have appeared at uh, the Kiv Mahila University. Yes. Um, and um, so it was based on their tradition that were taken right from, from so-called European space, right from, from all the uh, European ac Academy. But it was created in order to basically oppose uh, their, uh, their yes, Jesuit, Jesuit. Jesuit tradition. Uh, so something that we uh, um, we take from another culture could be also their uh, the, our instrument of in this culture. This this I think is interesting. And um, well, finally, finally, uh, he he gives a lot of uh, examples of how uh, personalities should be treated in terms of uh, studying transnational history. And he points out that uh, well, uh, with national history. Certain personality is treated like exclusively the representative of certain yeah. culture. Yes. So if it is Franco, it's only the Ukrainian writer, and it belongs only to Ukrainian culture. But uh, he said that Franco was also uh, writing in German and in Polish. Uh, he was part of the Austro-Hungarian, uh, therefore cultural space, and he's part of the Austro-Hungarian history somehow and so on. Therefore it is uh, much broader than only being, being Ukrainian. And the same goes with many other composers that, that were uh, um, uh, having similar strategies of creating national uh, songs, national traditions, but were, uh, were using absolutely different uh, um, international traditions. Yeah. Yes. I think I will stop with this. So I think Alina did a really nice um, summary and advertisement for this article, yeah. right? It's really Which is really, it's really great because um, I think he both, you, you summarize this very nicely, that he um, offers Ukraine as an example, um, as, as part of transnational history for Europe, right? That we need to include Ukraine but also talks about how useful transnational history can be for Ukraine itself, right? And he sort of divides transnational history up into these different ideas, right? Transfer history, comparative history, right? Entangled history, right? These different ideas that can be really useful for looking at Ukraine. So particularly for people who study Ukraine, I would highly recommend this article. I think it's like a classic. Um, and even for people looking at other regions, it might be really great to sort of take some stuff, right? Um, from this article. And I think it really um, contributes to this AHR uh, roundtable, right? It really shows how useful Ukraine is um, for that. Um, so one of the other critiques of this roundtable is that it's too modern, right? And it's too sort of focused on um, 
late 19th, early 20th century, right? Transnationalism beginning with industry and railroads. And the second article I assigned is very much about, um, yeah, actually we could have transnationalism a lot earlier, right? Um, from an early modern um, historian um, who works at the European University in Florence. So Alina, would you like to present this article? for the so-called modernity of the transnational mm -hmm. history. And in this article, the author questions several issues. For example, should we consider globalization as a contemporary event or a long process? And in this case, maybe we should review uh, the history from the global point of view, the early history. Also, she questions uh, if we should uh, um, study apart the local history and the global history, and what methodology we should use if we uh, study early modern periods. So the first question um, that she asks is the global history is only about the contemporary uh, yeah. periods. Um, mm, she tries to um, make a little survey uh, and study the the uh, stages, the forms of globalization, and she uh, also uh, says that uh, in this uh, very particular period, uh, we need to change our look and uh, to have a look at the past uh, in the global sense. So we need to review the history from the point of view of global history, but not only the last hundred years, but yeah. the uh, early uh, period also. Um, she also says this, um, she uses this definition of the uh, translation, transnational history, the history of interconnections, but she says, she argues that uh, these connections uh, were constructed or built much more earlier yeah. than the modern age. Um, she tries to define the issues that caused, caused transnational history. For example, the first of them is awareness of diversity. Uh, that was very important for the global and transnational history. The question of identity, for example. Uh, also, the um, national crisis um, that also improved the development of uh, transnational history. The article is divided into several parts. For example, the first part is called uh, Global and Transnational History, Old Wine in New uh, Wines. Yeah. So she tries to, to um, define the relation between two names, two labels, and to see if it's applicable to different periods of the history. Um, but I think that she makes a conclusion that uh, global history is not po possible with translation without translational transnational history, and um, she also argues that these two types of history they can improve not only the knowledge about the the country abroad but about our own country. So this, this like a mutual uh, enrichment uh, of the new knowledge. Um, then. One, uh, one little citation. She says that um, the global history should be also translation, transnational history or cross-cultural history in the broadest sense. So she uh, actually she doesn't want to oppose these two uh, trends, but uh, the connection, the link between two of yeah. them, can enrich our research. The second uh, part is uh, global and transnational history at the early modern period, uh, the question mark. Here she argues that uh, we should review the period of the application of the methodology of transnational history and sh we should look at the past events and to find uh, uh, the roots of the modern state in the past. Uh, there are several examples. I'm not really strong in history, so yeah, that's okay. <laughs> those who are interested, they will look uh, close at the article. Um, and uh, um, one more um, part 
here. I'm looking. Mm -hmm. uh, she talks also about the local history and the localization of the global yeah. aspect. So uh, her argument is we the same thing. We cannot exclude local history from the global, and the same thing we can cannot exclude the local and the global from the translational. So yeah. I think it's like. Uh, the change of the scale, the same yeah, thing. Yeah. But um, the question is to what extent they are interconnected. Not the question about the interconnection itself, but to what extent and what effect causes another, so what consequences we have in, on different, different levels. And uh, the last uh, is uh, the last part of if about new parameters, new challenges, new methodology. Um, she also questions about the sources, about the language that we need to use, about the, uh, the key terms. For example, she says if we do translation, transnational history, we need to use lingua franca, English. We need to change maybe the archives to laboratory. Uh, some questions that maybe don't have solution, but they are rising in the article, and maybe it can give some ideas about the way to explore uh, some events. Uh, I think generally it's everything. The, the main um, idea is um, inclusion uh, of all the facts of local, global, and transnational history in the research, uh, and the awareness of the diversity and also this double perspective from uh, the from inside and from outside. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Thank you so much, Elena. Um, <coughs> yeah, it's a very useful article, I think, not only for including that early modern um, period, but also for really thinking about this this local, global, transnational, right? I think it's a, a really useful article, and you summarize that um, really, really well, right? Um, so building on kind of some of our critiques of this roundtable um, and sort of the lack of, um, of, uh, of our, our region, um, Russian, Eastern Europe, Eurasia, um, there, uh, our third article, um, Elsa is presenting, yeah? And we just have three other um, kind of addenda to this roundtable, right? And sort of showing how, um, you know, you can read a roundtable or something and, and how that can then spark ideas, right? Um, and this article that, that I wrote very much came from thinking about transnationalism. I'm um, reading this roundtable, um, reading this critique by Michael David Fox, and being really, really frustrated with um, the work that I'd read on Soviet culture. So really trying to work out how can I use this idea of transnationalism in my own work, right? And trying to figure out how to use it in Ukraine, how to use it in theater in Ukraine. And that's where um, this article um, came from that Elsa's going to tell us all about. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's a bit easier because the questions can actually be answered <laughs> by someone. Um, so this is your article looking at so they're comparing and contrasting Bulgakov and Kunish, Kunish, um, and their styles of theatre and how that played into looking at transnationalism in the 1920s, really in um, Ukraine, and looking at spatial dynamics and how you can look at culture through space, um, and I think the main point that you were making was that the, the rise of Moscow as this cultural center wouldn't have been possible without the provinces, the southwest, yeah. and I think you make a point of you need to provincialize Moscow, yeah. <laughs> which I like that, um, and also you're making this, this interesting argument of not looking at Soviet, just Soviet versus Ukrainian identities, but also Soviet Ukrainian identities. Um, and then the way these sort of transnational flows create these um, yeah, flows of, of exchange and then eventually imbalance and it sort of collapses. Um, this is more of like the introductory part about um, the idea of, of I think traveling troops yeah. and this very multi-ethnic, multi-cultural theater landscape uh, in Ukraine at the time, and not just looking at what was happening in Moscow, but also these other uh, cities, and how 
in some cases there would be restrictions on what theatres could show and what theatres could not show. And then I think in one case, the governor of the region sort of yeah. said, well, we might as well show it because everyone's seen it already. Like, yeah. Yeah. these sort of, it's this sort of way. Um, yeah, last year I read uh, The White Guard, yeah. and that's why I chose this presentation. <laughs> um, I actually read it in summer, but it's a lot more of like a wintry book. Mm. Um, and it's quite a bourgeois um, presentation of what happened in Kiev in 1919? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The Civil War, yeah. yeah. Um, and he's drawing on his experiences as an army doctor, whereas Kurdish actually fought in the Red Army, and Bogartov was later criticized for this yeah. sort of his perspective. Um, and yeah, and again, the idea of these intellectuals and these very artistic people who went to Moscow from this area to actually create Soviet culture. Um, and then they, some of them return back to their, their homeland and say, you know, there's nothing here, it's, it's, a, it's a dead space. And I don't know whether in the sort of quote, of the quotes of this person who returned, he sort of gets the irony of, or the sort of deeper layer of sort of, yeah, well, you've left. So yeah. if you leave, if everyone leaves um, and you return and you say, oh, there's nothing here, who's to blame for that? Um, right. And it made me think about, um, in the EU, we always think of brain drain from places like Romania, Bulgaria, it's a purely economic problem. Mm. And what about culture and what happens to culture in these places and artistic institutions when, if you're considered good enough, then you feel, you know, then I'm gonna go to London or Paris or Berlin. Um, and I haven't really ever come across literature that considers cultural brain drain. I don't know if you know of anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think that would be an interesting yeah. topic. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, what happens then? And I think moving away from this economic brain drain idea is really interesting. Um, and yeah, Kulish's work, uh, Samata Pathetique, was mm -hmm. basically a response to what he thought of Bogakov's. Yeah. They are the turbans is this completely bourgeois, cozy um, lens of, of the revolution, and it was a lot more grimy, unfiltered, um, complex story. Um, and he disliked how Ukrainians were portrayed, how um, it wasn't experimental, it was very safe, and um, it's a very nice story. Yeah. But I, uh, reading this, yeah, it made me reconsider um, the story. Um, and then this is the part that I really um, put on the slide to, so you can read, because it really relates to what we were talking yesterday about cultural autonomy and how the meaning of something can completely shift over time. Um, and so his play was, well, he was murdered by the, by the regime, mm -hmm. um, but his play was smuggled out, first to Lviv um, by his son and then to the West. And so what was once um, a so very Soviet Ukrainian in Kharkiv um, writing about revolution became a Ukrainian, uh, a cultural artifact that was seen as a Ukrainian nationalist um, piece that was deeply anti Soviet. Um, and yeah, this sort of just lays out, I think it's, it really related to what we were talking about yesterday. Um, and I think the final part, or one of the final yeah. parts, is about Ukrainians, Ukrainianiz Ukrainization <laughs> as a problem. So this I found really interesting because I've never heard of this, this side of the story of how once you put people in ethno-national categories um, from Moscow, sort of centralizing everything, so okay, you are a Jew, you're a Ukrainian, you're Armenian, and you must produce culture that is Armenian. Mm -hmm. or, but, but what is you know Ukrainian culture? Yeah. If you go to Odessa, it's it's different to Viv, it's different to Lara. Um, and so there would be Ukrainian plays for Ukrainians and Jewish plays for Jews. And um, in Moscow, however, there wasn't Moscow plays for Muscovites, you know, it was, it was different. Um, and I think what I thought of when I, when I was reading this and how Moscow decided what Ukraine should produce was um, this mural, which is in yeah. Kievskaya metro station in Moscow, which shows this very um, cute sort of 
uh, view of Ukrainian life, and um, it's on outside Sofie, Sofievska Cathedral, and everyone's there and dancing in the Shivankas and wearing flower crowns. And if you're someone like Kulish living in Kharkiv and wanting to do something very avant garde and very yeah, um, experimental, you think, well, no, we want you to be in a Vishivanka and you perform for us. And yeah. that's all that sort of um, view from Moscow of Ukrainization actually being limiting for people like Kulish and his work. Um, and then I was also thinking um, maybe going more into looking at how. Once you tr once you challenge provincialization or provincial stereotypes, how that's challenging the entire structure. Yeah. So it may seem sort of marginal that okay, I don't want to be seen as some provincial type, but in fact, in this system, like that's challenging everything and challenging this big structure that's in place. And then the final part was what I found really interesting was the fact that within one decade, so 1926 to 1937. Yeah the cultural landscape of Kharkiv like, completely shifted. So from this place of incredibly avant-garde theater and yeah. art to um, pr being provincialized, um, and then eventually with you know, the murders of hundreds of thousands of people um, because they were artistic heavyweights, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this was the final question. If Ukraine, of your question, if Ukraine yeah. can no longer be a periphery, can Moscow remain a cultural center? Which I think is quite a, a provocative or like good way to end yeah. an article yeah. with, um, yeah, with this sort of what happens when transnational flow, trans yeah, transnational flows stop or disrupted or for many many reasons, um, what happens to this center that relied so much yeah. on the provinces for inspiration. So. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Alexander. Um, thank you so much for that very generous reading of my article. Thank you. Um, um, but, uh, you know, one of the things that I was trying to work through was how do we take transnationalism to an empire, right? And really trying to look at the regions inside an empire and the dynamics between them, right? And um, I was really frustrated with this idea that Soviet culture is sort of a monolithic thing, and all the examples being from Moscow and Leningrad, right? And I really wanted to sort of bring this region into the picture, right? And look at how this dynamic actually created Soviet culture, right? And the importance of the provinces, right, um, in doing that, right? And that, that the art, the work that was created here actually was really important in that story, right? Um, so bringing um, Ukraine into the conversation. So, um, uh, thanks so much for our discussion today of transnationalism. We're moving tomorrow um, to taking these questions of culture to societies themselves, not society, not um, geographic places as much as societies themselves um, and the self itself, right? Um, so we'll talk about gender, about sexuality, right? Um, about class, um, about Bourdieu's concept of distinction and taste. Right, dividing society. So, can I have two volunteers? Do we have one who wants to work on Maria Bukur's article on gender in Eastern Europe? <laughs> yes, fabulous, fabulous, excellent, excellent. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, and then um, any volunteers for Katarzyna Kosmala on sexuality? Fabulous, great, perfect. Um, Thanks so much, you guys. Really great work today. Really great focus. Um, let's go have lunch. <laughs> <laughs>